Vinland Saga, the epic creation of Makoto Yukimura, is amazing. It's definitely top 5 material. And one of my favourite characters, that is an Einar, is Canute, the son of King Swain who starts off quite timid but grows into this Machiavellian schemer. And I was taken aback when I watched the show. My degree's in history, but I don't know that much about Vikings. And when I envisioned a king of the Vikings, this was not the character my mind conjured up. And I did some further research, and it turns out Canute, the real Canute, is really interesting. Um, historian Ryan Lavelle describes him as one of the great what-ifs of English history. He could have permanently moved the seat of England into Danish control. In fact, he was cut from the same cloth as great history makers like Alexander or Augustus, so why don't we remember him like that? Well, today I want to kind of answer that, uh, also look at the fictional character and the real Canute and compare them, and just give a brief overview of the life and times of Canute, the self-styled king of all of England and Denmark, and the Norwegians and part of the Swedes. So Canute, whose name just means not, is the second son of the Danish king Svein, who himself is the son of the legendary Viking Harold Bluetooth. Knut is second in line to the throne after his brother Harold. And pretty much right away, we get our first divergence from fiction and reality. Knut was not timid in his early years. In 1013, when Svein invaded England, Knut was part of his army, the army that helped push King Ethelred out of England and into Normandy and establish Svein's control over England. In fact, Canute was so popular with the Vikings that when Svein died in early 1014, they almost immediately appointed him their King of England. A trait that's highlighted in the anime is Canute's ruthlessness, and this is definitely on full display in 1014. When Ethelred returns from Normandy and begins pushing his claim as King of England, Canute mutilates all the English hostages in his care. He removes their hands, their ears, their noses, and then lets them live to spread terror about him and his men. But Canute isn't a blood-crazed lunatic, he's not Joffrey Baratheon. As this war continues into 1014, Ethelred is able to garner support from the Norwegian King Olaf, as well as the Viking warlord Thorkel the Tall. So Canute withdraws, he heads back to Denmark to make plans and prepare, rather than fighting a war he's never going to win. So, back in Denmark, Canute, being a keen observer and an opportunistic strategist, waits for two years, returning to England in 1016 when Olaf has left England to raid Western Europe, and Ethelred is facing a rebellion from his son Edmund. Here, Canute would utilise the chaos to basically sweep across England, taking as much land as he could. He'd also showcase his ability to let go of grudges when he recruits Thorkel back onto his side. In April of 1016, Ethelred dies, so England is now up for grabs by either Canute or Edmund. Edmund begins amassing a force of West Saxons to go and face Canute's army who have been sailing down the Thames into Essex. The two forces eventually meet at the Battle of Asandum, the English forming up into three lines. The Danes are outnumbered, but are able to secure a victory because during the battle, Edric, the Elderman of Mercia, leaves the battle letting the Scandinavians break the English lines and win a decisive victory. It's very likely that this entire thing had been orchestrated by Canute. Edric used to be one of his supporters who had since defected to join the English, and it's very likely that they had made some kind of deal. Canute would take extreme measures to ensure that Edric was forevermore painted as a coward, that's even how he appears in Vinland Saga, and he would eventually behead him and have his head displayed on a spike outside of Tower Hill in London. Now that he was officially king, Canute immediately got about making changes to England. He was very keen on delegation, he was very ambitious and wanted to control lots of land and didn't want to have to sit around running all of it. So he broke England into four pieces, he assigned different areas of it to different people. He took the lion's share for himself, but he also gave Wessex to his old enemy Edmund in a show of good faith, and he would also give areas to Thorkel and another Viking named Eric. Now, Edmund would eventually die, and Canute would take his land. He might have even murdered him, but this does go to show that Canute was interested in building up his power base in England before moving on to anything else. He wanted to have firm control over it. And unlike basically every English king before, Canute did not have to do mass violence to bring people in line. He was pretty covert in what he did, 
a lot of fear tactics. He would, if an English noble spoke out against them, have them covertly assassinated and then replace them with a Norseman. So eventually his court was very sympathetic towards him. On top of this, Canute did a lot to get his face out there. He released coins with his face on, which is actually very important in getting the everyday peasant to recognize you as their king because you're the one on the money. Uh, another thing that helped Canute a lot was the fact that he was a third generation Christian. He was not a convert, as is kind of implied in the show. He was born and raised that way. His grandfather, Harold Bluetooth, liked to brag there's several runestones etched with this information that he had brought Christianity to the Vikings. In fact, it was already becoming quite popular in a lot of Scandinavia by the time Canute was even born. As such, Canute was viewed as an English Christian king rather than a pagan invading menace. He fostered good relations with the church. He had close friendships with people such as Archbishop Wolfston. That said, for all his talk of building a perfect kingdom on earth to mirror God's perfect kingdom of heaven, Canute wasn't always the best Christian. It's widely believed he was already married when he married Emma, the widow of King Ethelred, just to cement his rule in England. So he just had two wives. This is a far cry from the show where Canute is portrayed as having nothing to do with women, basically, to the point where the creator had to clarify that he does have a wife and he's not a virgin. <laughs> so Canute's early rule in England was great and he spent a lot of time and effort cementing it and making sure that he had a good solid base of power. But as we know from the show, he would also become king of Denmark. So did that happen how it happened in the show or did it happen differently? Let's find out. So in Vinland Saga, Canute kills his brother Harold and usurps his throne. In reality, we actually don't know that much about Harold and the events leading up to his death in 1019 are kind of all over the place. What we do know is that in 1018, the year prior to Harold's death, Canute was up to something. It seems as though he was confident in his hold of England and he had had a son with Emma, Harder Canute, who could present an heir if anything should happen to him, so he collected the largest ever geld payment made to a viking. The equivalent today would be £82,000 and started building a massive fleet. He commissioned 40 ships. And it seems like Canute is just militarizing at this point, though exactly for what we're not really sure, because the following year he goes to Denmark, Harold dies, we don't really know how, and Canute is made king of Denmark. We know no one questions his succession because he's got 40 ships, but that's really all we know about it. And Canute isn't even in Denmark for that long here. He doesn't have time to go to Kettle's Farm and chat to Thorfinn. He has to go back to England because this guy called the Peasant King is starting a revolt and Canute has to go massacre peasants and show people that you can't revolt against him. After this, he kicks Forkel out of England as well. We're not really sure why, because he eventually gives him effective control over Denmark just a few years later. It's probably just like a minor falling out. But yeah, Canute is now king of England and Denmark, and he sets about building his North Sea Empire. You know, he's not content with just two countries. So with his massive fleet, he just starts being a menace. And not only did he have a huge naval fleet, he also possibly had the biggest Viking ship ever. The Roskilde 6 was discovered in the 1990s and dated back to Canute's reign. It is, to date, the longest Viking ship ever discovered. Needless to say, at this point, Canute was the undisputed king of the North Sea. He would frequently sail between England and Denmark in this time, showcasing his power and just kind of flaunting it and whenever anyone had a disagreement with him he would just make their lives harder for instance when he had issues with the norwegians he would just blockade all of the sea lanes so their sailors would have to carry supply over freezing cold scandinavian land Knut made powerful allies too he wasn't all about ruling by himself 
he would marry his daughter Gunhild off to Henry, the son of the then Holy Roman Emperor Conrad. Knut had really good relationships with the Holy Roman Empire, mainly because he was just a big Rome nerd. He got very into it when he went over there. And at this point, it seemed like Knut was just unstoppable. He would claim Skane in Sweden, um, establishing a foothold there, and in 1028, he would just take all of Norway. He didn't battle anyone for it, he was just so powerful that when he arrived to do battle with King Olaf, his former rival from way back before he was even King of England, the nobles just kicked out Olaf and let Canute in. He did a similar thing in 1031 when he went to Scotland, and many Scottish kings just gave him the land. So why did he stop? Why did he have all of this, set up all these systems, and then just lose momentum? Perhaps the best known story about Canute is depicted in Vinland Saga. The story goes that Canute was standing before several of his vassals and then attempts to command the sea. The direct quote is as following. You are subject to me. As the land on which I am standing is mine and no one has resisted my overlordship with impunity, I command you, therefore, not to rise on my land nor to presume to wet the clothing of your master. For a lot of people, this is an example of Canute's folly. It's him being completely unaware of the limits of his power. However, I don't think that's what the story is. Canute was known to be incredibly introspective. Following his campaigns into Scotland in 1031, he would become more static, but many of the trips he would take would be to graves of past rivals such as Edmund, at the same time, he was battling with an illness. He would eventually succumb to it in 1035. In fact, in many tellings of the story, including the telling presented to us in Vinland Saga by Yakimura, Canute is completely aware that he cannot stop the waves. He is not trying to demonstrate that he can, he's trying to demonstrate the limits of his power. And this is why I think, for all of its historical inaccuracies, Vinland Saga does touch on the heart of Canute. He is an introspective person. He's willing to do very, very evil things to achieve an end result he wants. And as is seen at the end of his reign, when he's built his kingdom, he's aware of the limits of his power. He knows when it's time to stop and just try and live in the world he has created. And the only thing that keeps him out of the historical consciousness as much as figures such as Augustus or Alexander is really just documentation and time. If he had been better documented and if he had had more time to set up his Nazi empire, Canute could be one of the all-time most influential historical figures. So in summary, I would say I agree with Ryan Lavelle. I think Canute is a fascinating historical what if and I will forever be grateful for Makoto Yukimura bringing him to my attention. Historical fiction is not always the best way to analyse the past, but it's a very interesting way to breathe new life and new perspectives into those who came before us.